And we are. So uh, again, uh, good morning. My name is Rich Sloma. Welcome to the New York State Archives webinar entitled The New LGS-1 Featuring Records of School Districts, BOCES, and Other Educational Governments. Um, today's presenter is Sarah Derling. Sarah is the New York State Archives Regional Advisory Officer for our Western New York region. Uh, this region covers the 15 counties of Western New York. Also with us today uh, is Dennis Riley. Dennis will be uh, in the, on the sidelines. Dennis is the Regional Advisory Officer for the Hudson Valley Catskill Region on the other side of the state. Uh, please note that this webinar is being recorded. Uh, we ask that you type any questions you have in the chat box uh, as they pop up for you and we will take them at the end of the presentation. And at this point in time, uh, I will turn it over to Sarah. So uh, I'm going to see. Um, <laughs> I think we made you the presenter. Oh yes. Let's right there. See. I'm passing the privileges on to you. So. I have privilege. Um, right. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning. Just before we get going, I want to mention that we have some upcoming webinars that you may be interested in. Um, yesterday we had, we had the municipality one. Today is the BOCES one. Uh, school districts and BOCES one. But tomorrow, if you know somebody who is in a government that's one of our more special and unique ones and they may need um, information about the retention schedule, we're having a session for them tomorrow. And then come the fall, we're actually getting into the more meat and potatoes of records management um, with a series of webinars such as what does the genealogist want from you, managing oversized maps, plans, and drawings, which having been in a few school districts, this may be of value to some of you folks, um, creating file plans, and in December, maintaining an inactive storage area, which again, may be a lot of value to folks. So if you're interested in any of those, please hit the link down there um, on our website, and you can register for any of them. As always, all of our training is free. So, as you may have just heard, my name is Sarah Durling. I am the New York State Regional Advisory Officer for Western New York. Um, and I'm just so happy to see so many people here. Hi. Um, I know it's an interesting time for everyone, particularly with the, for educators, as you're trying to get the whole new school year up and running, trying to figure out how everything's going to work. So I really appreciate that you took the time to attend today. Today we're going to talk about everybody's favorite topic, retention schedules, and very specifically the new one, the LGS-1, and how it impacts you and the, and the way you use the ED-1. So we have a fairly short and straightforward roadmap to get where we're going today. First, we're going to talk about what the LGS-1 retention schedule is and why it's something that you really need to pay attention to. Next, we're going to go over how you use the retention schedule, how you find things, how you use the new search tool, which is like super cool, and things like that. After that, we'll go over what the major changes are on the items that impact school districts and BOCES. Um, we're just going to do a high-level overview, but we're going to hit on the ones that are really important to you. And finally, we're going to go over just a few things to know before we leave and do a quick recap of what we've learned. We will be taking questions at the end if there's time. Um, so please, as Rich said, feel free to enter them in the chat box and we'll have them to go at, at, when we hit the break point. So what's a retention schedule anyway? Um, if these are new to you, a retention schedule is a document created by the State Archives that lists the minimum amount of time that you need to maintain the records that your government, your school district is creating. The Archives develops these schedules after conducting a lot of research and into the laws, the regulations, and how these records are used in New York State, and goes through a fairly rigorous approval process before we publish them for you to use. Some of the key things to know about the schedules is that they're a legal document. The published schedule lists the amount of time that you are legally required to hold on to your records. The retention periods listed in the schedule are minimums. You can hold on to your records for longer than the identified retention period if you need to, um, but we do recommend that you have a good reason for doing so and that you document it if that's a choice you make. The schedule is media neutral. 
So what that means is it does not matter if your record is in paper, if it's an electronic format, if it's on an audio cassette that you have to wind with a pencil. The retention period given for a record is the same across all of the formats. We don't break that out retention for one or the other. The schedule does not mandate destruction. This means we don't tell you how to destroy your records. We leave that up to you. You know your records best, you know the content of your records best, and what the best way to dispose of those records is going to be. Maybe you have records with sensitive information in them that needs to be destroyed in a confidential and secure fashion. Maybe you have records that it's perfectly okay to stick them in the recycling bin and send them off that way. It's something that you need to decide how to handle. And the retention schedule does not address all records management issues, such as what records you should create and how you should store them. Again, that's something that's up to you. And just because an item is in the retention schedule, just so you guys are aware, does not mean that you need to create those records. You are school districts and BOCES. You probably do not want to put in an airport just so that you can you know, manage airport records. Although I think your students would probably appreciate it. I'm not gonna lie. Um, so why do you want to use a retention schedule? There are any number of reasons that you would want to use a retention schedule, but here are five. One, you can keep those records as long as you're legally required to. There's no guesswork involved. You, can, you don't have to try to figure out, well, maybe I need to hold on to these records for this long, or well, I've got to do a bunch of research and figure out what the best practices are for this. No, this is a document that you have been provided that tells you exactly how long you need to hold on to them for, and you just have to follow along with that. The next three are kind of interrelated because it allows you to discard records that you no longer need. You don't have to hold on to records after a certain period for, in most cases. So it allows you to destroy, destroy them, dispose of them, and it allows you to improve your records retrieval because with fewer records, you don't spend as much time in, in staff salary and staff time, staff money, searching through the records, trying to find the one that you're looking for because if it's there, it's there somewhere. Um, you're not guessing. And it helps you save money and space because if you are paying for storage, whether it's physical storage for boxes of records or cloud storage for a volume of electronic records, you're only going to be paying for the record storage space that you actually need to have. You can get rid of anything that you don't need to have um, so that you're not spending money on things that can be used, spending money that can be used for other things, let's put it that way. And it helps you identify your permanent records because your permanent records are the ones that are going to be listed in the schedule as permanent. Um, there are definitely cases where you are going to want to appraise records for historical value that may not be listed as permanent, but by and large, that work is already done for you. It's already stated in the schedule. All right, so the one bit of good news that I really want to share with folks is that if you're familiar with the old retention schedule, the ED1, learning to use the, the LGS1 is not going to be a steep curve because by and large, it's the same schedule. Um, we use the same layout, we use the same design. It, it's not something that you're going to have to learn a whole new process for. If you can navigate the ED1, you can navigate the LGS1. Um, but, you know, if you need a refresher, if this is new to you, I mean, first and foremost, you just want to identify your record series because you need to know the records that you're working with before you try looking for the retention of them. And sometimes you might find that you're dealing with more than one series that have been organized, grouped together. Um, sometimes it's a case file, sometimes it's a personnel file. You want to make sure that you identify all of the records that are within that, that are in that file and work with the series that you are looking for. You want to determine the official copy, and I kind of think of this as the one ring approach to records management. There is one copy of a record that rules the retention for all of them. Your official copy is the one copy that the retention schedule applies to. It's the one that you have to retain for however long the schedule says. All other copies could potentially be considered duplicates and disposed of when no longer needed. 
next, you want to check the schedule's fun functional headings, and we have kept these largely the same from the LED one. Um, the two major changes are general, which is the very first item in the schedule, um, is no longer just general, we renamed it to general administration. And we also eliminated the miscellaneous section. We've kind of massaged those records into the sections they belong into. Um, but yeah, if you know that your records are supposed to be in fiscal, you want to go looking. You, you you can go look in the fiscal section. And go okay, it's probably going to be in here. Or if you know that your records are student records, you can go in the student records section. They're going to be in there. There is an index in the back of the schedule that can help you get what you get what you're looking for. Um, I've always been fond of it. You can keyword search in the electronic version. If you've got the PDF up, you can um, control F and keyword search what you're looking for. Also, and we're going to show you how to do this, we have a really super nifty version online where you can just search through the website, um, which I think a lot of you are going, are going to find very valuable. And then if you still can't find it, call your REO, call the State Archives, because that's what we're here for. We're ha here to help you find items in that retention schedule. All right, so let's see if we can do the demo. And I need to share my screen. Bear with me, folks. All right, can you see the New York State Archives webpage? All right, I'm going to assume this is a yes. So we're going to go to Managing Records. We're going to go to Retention and Disposition Schedules. Um, we are going to go down the page to uh, Sarah. Yes, sir. Sorry to interrupt. Um, I saw one person chime in that they can't see it, and actually on my screen, yeah. I see that you are sharing your screen, but for some reason, I don't know if it's my monitor or not, um, has it all kind of grayed out. <gasps> I don't know if Rich is, yeah, Monica yep. just chimed in saying we are right. missing a uh, tan box. Oh, that's interesting. I wonder um, Rich, are you seeing the same thing? That is correct, yeah. It's a, kind of a, you can see that we have the archives colors there. There's, something's being shared, but it's not. Uh, not what we want to share, huh? Yeah, it's not. Uh, it seems almost like I can see your cursor moving around. That is strange. All right. Do you me... see the. I don't know if you want to yeah, unshare and try to share again. Yeah, let's try that and see if we can get that to work. I will say I saw a version of that in previous, uh, t when we were testing it the other day, but not as bad. Not as bad. Uh -huh. Well, let's give it a whirl. It's just your luck. You know, interaction with my, is always an interesting challenge when I come to, when it comes to my presentation. I try though. All right. Um, oh, it's going to make me go through this. All right. That's better, though. So. Yeah. Yeah, it looks. Uh... Let's try that. So do we see the archives website? Yes. Yes. All right. Yes. So we're going to managing records and retention schedules. Are we on the retention schedules page? Yes. All right. We're doing awesome. I, I trust that this is going to work now. So we're going to scroll down the retention schedules page, folks. Um, and when we get to the local government retention and disposition schedule section, this is where we start talking about the new local government schedule. First and foremost, I just want to point out a couple of links that are in this section that you may find useful. First of all, you do need to adopt the schedule via resolution. We will talk about this further on, but there is a link right here to the model resolution form. If you need to have a sample to develop that, that exists right here. We also have a list of major revisions here that you can also take a look at. Now, if you scroll down a little further, there is a little link right here for the LGS-1. We're going to hit that. It's going to be awesome. And this takes you to the main LGS-1 page. Um, if you scroll down a little further, we get to a printable PDF. And I'm not going to open it up because 
I don't trust the technology at this point. Um, but if you open it up that's, or, or download a copy of it, that is a PDF copy of the entire schedule. And it'll allow you, it'll be just like the ED1, the same schedule that you've always had access to. But what we have over here, which I think is super cool and I think you'll enjoy, is we have an HTML version of all the schedule items. So all the sections here, you can open one up and you know see what you're looking for. Um, just go down to school district and BOCES section, which will open up all of the school district and BOCES items and break it out by the subsections as well. So all of those items are right there already. But my favorite thing here is this link right here that says search the schedule. So say I'm looking for immunization records. Let's plug that in. Um, plug in immunization, hit apply. Boom. We are going to have student health records, immunization right there. Um, it doesn't bring up anything that does have immunization listed in it, and you do want to be careful about making sure that you're using um, singulars and plurals because it, it is going to look for the exact word. Um, and if you plug in immunizations, while it will work, um, it may not get necessarily get you the right item that you're looking for. Um, but for student health record, let's pop that open. Um, we have it says we've got the title. We've got a diamond here to indicate that there has been a major revision to it. We have the current schedule item number, the brand new schedule item number, so it's 899. And we list all the previous schedule items. Um, and in this case, it was only ever in the, the ED1, so we only have ED1 137 listed. Um, but it also gives you all of the retention periods for all of the sub items in here. So. And I have, and we'll talk about the change to it, which is going to be item E right here. But it's a, it's pretty straightforward. I think it's really helpful because, I mean, you get all the possible items that it could be, and sometimes there might be multiple items to something you're looking for, so you can kind of suss out what you're looking for. Um, it shows you right off the bat whether or not it is a major revision, whether there's been a change to that item. And it tells you exactly what it used to be in the old schedule. Um, and if I wanted to look up, Say I knew it was 137. I just wanted to look up 137 in the schedule and see what the new number is. Um, I can find the item that has 137 in the previous schedules and know automatically that it is new, the new number for that is 899. So I do think folks will find this pretty helpful, um, particularly as they're going through their schedules, through their office schedules, through their inventories and updating them. And with that, we will bounce back from our schedule demo and talk about office schedules a little bit. Um, office schedules can be really helpful. They can help demystify records retention for your office staff, um, for the folks in your departments and your, in your different buildings. Because if you throw down the entire schedule in front of them, that might be a little intimidating. There's a lot of items in it. There's a lot of sections in it, some of which do not are never going to apply to you. Um, you guys aren't counties, so you don't have to worry about the county section, for example. And that can be intimidating for folks who aren't familiar with the schedule. They don't, they don't know how to use it. Um, an office schedule can help you break down the, the schedule into just the items that folks need, you know, just the items the entire district needs or just the items the, you know, guidance office needs specifically into a single document that you can share with them and say, these are the only ones you have, these are the only ones that you have to worry about. You don't have to try to figure out where your things are. You just need to worry about these retention schedule items when you are managing your records. Um, it makes it very it, nice, neat, and concise in that regard. The, another nice thing about reten office retention schedules is that it allows you to document things that aren't necessarily in the schedule. Um, for example, say you want to have a longer retention for records. Uh, we were just looking at immunizations, and I happen to know that there are a lot of school districts who, despite the fact that immunizations have a fairly short retention period in the grand scheme of things, um, are choosing to maintain them permanently for their students as a courtesy. Um, because the students can't find them in their doctor's offices anymore, but they still need them as they move through their lives. This would be a place that you could document that, yes, we are maintaining these, these, 
these um, immunization forms longer. We are keeping them permanently. It allows you to identify records by common name and what is in the schedule may not necessarily be what you actually call it in real life. Um, Form 137 is not necessarily something that the State Archives is going to know about, but it's going to be something that may be very valuable to your government in terms of filling out specific paperwork. And this is where you would be able to identify that, you know, personnel, our personnel forms use 137 to decline um, insurance paper, decline district insurance. Um, so you want to make sure that you are documenting that sort of information and it'll make it easier for folks who are using these retention schedules, these office schedules to manage their records. Obviously you want to indicate the retention on them um, because that's what they're there for. These really do help implement records management because you can use them for training, you can use them to, to do refreshers on managing folks' records, um, identify what people are dealing with in their offices. And they also serve as a nice um, subject matter list for FOIL. You are required to have one legally. So these document all the records that you are dealing with in your district, and it's a nice duplicate. So the LGS-1 overview. Um, this is pretty straightforward. I think a lot of you know a lot of these things. We combined four schedules into one. We took the ED1, the MU1, which is the municipality schedule, the CO2, which is the county schedule, and the MI1, which is the one for our more unique governments out there, and combined them into one giant comprehensive schedule. And this, we did this for a lot of reasons, um, one of which is because there was a lot of duplication across the schedules. Everybody had a meeting minutes item. Everybody had personnel items. Everybody had fiscal items. Everybody had correspondence. Um, and it just made sense to consolidate them down into one schedule so everybody was singing the same song, had the same numbers for everything. Um, we renamed the new schedule. It is the LGS-1, the Local Government Retention Schedule 1. Um, no, there's not an R in the LGS-1. I have been made aware of that. Um, and we are not going, planning on adding one anytime soon. We did retain the same section headings. I did mention this earlier. We try to keep them in the same places so that you know nothing's unfamiliar to you if you've already learned how to use the ED1. It should be fairly straightforward. Item numbers have changed, and uh, there wasn't any real way around this, unfortunately, just because of the way the schedule went together. Um, and that's when you want to use that search tool that I just showed you to try to figure out, okay, this used to be the number I was using. How do I, what's the new number in the schedule? Can I, and how do I apply that? We did flag major revisions and new change, new items only. So if the retention on something changed or if we added a new item, that's when it got that diamond added to it. Um, if it was just a minor change, like we rewarded something slightly, we didn't flag that as a change. And the schedule needs to be adopted by resolution, by your boards, by January 1st, 2021. The ED1 will no longer be valid after January 1st. So you have to have a new schedule in place. You have to have this adopted if you intend to continue managing and disposing of your records. You cannot legally do so unless you have the schedule in place. All right, so when you're looking at the new items, like I said, they've got that diamond in front of them. That's how you know that there's been a change. For items with multi-parts, that doesn't necessarily mean that A, B, C, D, E, they all receive changes. It could simply be that one, one sub-item in that schedule item changed. So you do want to make sure that you look at them closely and identify where that change is and if it impacts you. The other thing is the schedules do list the old numbers. It's not just the, the search tool. The PDF of the schedule and the print version of the schedule all list the former numbers for the, new, for the schedule items. So if there are no old schedule items associated with the, the, the item, that means it's brand new. There's no history behind it whatsoever. Well, in terms of retention schedule items. All right, so seven 
changes that folks should know about generally is that we consolidated various executive items into a single item, so it covers everybody. You know, your executives, your mayors, your superintendents, your administrators, your managers, your police chiefs, everybody. So you don't have to try to scramble figuring out what item that they belong to. There's just one, one for them. We renamed electronic data processing to in the information technology section to be information technology, and I can't tell you how much that makes my little geeky heart happy. Um, we did work to make the items consistent with the similar items in the state general schedule. It's the schedule that the state agencies use. Um, and we did make some, uh, some changes within the section. We did reduce the retention period for backup tapes and expanded them to include other incremental backup periods. And we added a new item to cover security breach notifications and reduce retention for computer system security records. Um, and this has been something that's been asked about. We updated retention periods for Medicare and Medicaid claims to 10 years based on the False Claims Act, which is, allows a state agency to bring a civil action to recover financial losses from a fraudulent claim. We updated the retention for child abuse reports to age 55 based on the Child Victims Act. Um, the public safety section also has a duplicate item for this. The attorney and counsel section has a clarifying note regarding video and audio recording evidence, um, and we made it consistent with the draft legal section in the state general schedule, um, and added subpoena records and evidence logs to it. We did update um, the uh, employment and affirmative action retention periods because there were some discrepancies across them that needed to be clarified. And we created a social services section for counties and other government types that needed it. When it comes to changes that are applicable to everybody across the board, um, we added, for meeting records, we added new items to cover meeting, uh, meetings that are not subject to the open meetings law. That includes internal meeting records and external group meeting files. Um, and we added a sub-item to meeting file, the meeting files item to clarify and reduce the retention of meeting notes. We updated, oops, shoot, sorry. Um, we updated the personnel and civil service section um, to broaden the scope for the item to cover employee benefit records um, and added items or sub, uh, sub items to beneficiary designation records, health insurance payout programs, and FMLA and COBRA compliance. We added new emergency and disaster related item, items, um, including for public health emergencies. Under the civil defense section, there are new items and sub-items to clarify the retention related to emergency distribution records, test evacuation and mock disaster response records, disaster preparedness and emergency management training materials, dam safety records, which are probably less important to you guys, and FEMA grants. Under the public health section, we added this pre-COVID, um, there is an item to cover public health incident records, including records related to public health emergencies, communicable disease occurrences, and epidemics. Um, we were apparently, unfortunately, prescient, prescient in, in adding that. Um, in the fiscal section, we've added a new item to cover electronic checks, and this has, without a question, been one of the most requested items in the schedule, if not the. Um, Local governments have been requesting special consent by the archives to be able to destroy these. Um, if you have one of, the, one of these special um, consents are, are in place already, um, with the LGS-1, those, those special consents have been withdrawn and you have to use the LGS-1 item, so please be aware of that. We've added um, items to cover requirements found in the GS and GASB 45 and 75, um, which is an accounting or fiscal reporting provision requiring government employers to measure and report the liabilities associated with other post-employment benefits um, like medical, pharmacy, dental, vision, life, um, that aren't associated with a, pro with, with a pension plan. We've revised the workers' case compensation item, uh, case, case records compensation item um, to a fold in exceptions to, and fold in an exception to sub item B into, 
sorry, I just tripped right over that. We've folded an exception to sub-item B into the retention period. We've eliminated some redundant text, and we've addressed financial records by adding a new sub-item in there as well. We've added in the Archives and Records Management section a item to cover a list of records that have been inadvertently been destroyed. Um, because it is, it is something that unfortunately does happen. Um, we've re reduced the retention of case files for, in the Human Rights section to three years. We've added a sub-item to personnel case files to um, authorize a shorter, shorter retention of the I-9 form and add new sub-items and reduce retention to um, security guard personnel files. We've added clarifying notes to the uh, assessment and tax rule forms um, so just because sometimes there, there is some difficulty in understanding exactly what copy we're, folks are looking at. And we've added, expanded the handicap parking permit records item to cover all parking items. So there are any changes that you are going to be needing to deal with, um, and before we get into them, there are some, there's something you need to be aware of. There are three sections in the schedule that deal with educational items. There's the community college section, there's the educational opportunity section, and there's the school districts and BOCI section. You want to make sure that you are in the right section for the records that you are dealing with. Um, I've already had a couple calls from folks who got caught up in the community college section. Um, and just because that was the first one that they saw that dealt with the record type that they were looking at. You want to make sure that you are using the right one, and for the most part, that's probably going to be in the school districts and BOCI section. So when it comes to the administration section, we've added a new item to cover questionnaires that are titled Student Race and Ethnicity Update, which had been sent to parents. Um, this is going to be item number 879. We've added new items to make this to make um, commencement records and alumni directory records um, consistent with the community college section. So for these records, you are going to be looking at number 884 for commencement records and 885 for alumni directory. Um, both of these have permanent elements to them. We've revised residency determination records to more accurately reflect how schools file their records in their retention period, because we really do want to make these retention schedules work the best for you um, and in ways that make sense for you. This item had been in the miscellaneous section, um, and we have since moved it to the administration section, um, and the new number for that is 888. We expanded appeals to the Commissioner of Education item, so it's not limited to those who are filed the ones that are filed pursuant to Education Law Section 310, but also includes Section um, 3012C and D, which relates to the annual professional performance reviews, those APPRs, um, and other appeals. This item, again, used to be in the miscellaneous section, and we've moved it to the administration section, um, and this um, item is number 889. When it comes to health, um, we, we've updated this, uh, the, the student health record and added a sub-item to include physician authorizations to resume athletic activity after a traumatic brain injury, a TBI, um, which have been very prominent in the news in, in the last few years. So that's going to be item 899, um, and that's sub-item E, so that's a, that is now a permanent record there. When it comes to instruction, um, we've added a new item to cover unused regents exams. Hooray! Um, this is item 913, and it's one year after the end of the, end of the school year. Um, we've also increased the retention period from testing papers um, uh, from one year to two years after a request from the State Education Department's te uh, Test Security Unit. Um, this is going to be in item 908.
school safety. So we've added a six section note to school safety because what happened was we removed um, building security records and video recordings to the public property and equipment section and we, and we wanted to note that. Um, also child abuse or maltreatment reports were relocated to the general administration and that's been noted as well. We did update the title and description of safety and emergency response plans. Um, and, and that would be item number 926. And updated school violence and dangerous school records to include um, DASA records, Digni Dignity for All Students Act. Um, and that's going to be item number 927. For the special ed records, um, we did address an inconsistency between the health records in the special ed uh, file item and the, the student health record item. Basically, we've removed reference to health I, to health records in the in the uh, special ed file, as they should be maintained with the student health records, and added a note to that effect. And that's going to be item 931. For student records, we added a note regarding um, ELA and math scores, um, noting that the requirement that is the student's individual scores on a grade three to eight state administered required, state administered standardized ELA or mathematics assessment be kept separate from the student's transcript and, per, and permanent record. We updated the student, rec student records covering non-district students item to include driver's education record and adult education record. Um, we clarified this item by adding a note. It also covers records of resident students taking high school equivalency and non-diploma courses and adult residents taking BOCES career and technical education courses. And this is definitely something that we've seen a lot of requests about. That is going to be covered by 949. Um, we've added references to homeschooling throughout the section as appropriate. We've added a new item to um, cover the student emergency contact record. This is item number 971, which covers names, addresses, the usual expected information for the emergency contact. We've added a new item to cover parental and other consents for the release of student record information as per FERPA. Um, we did model the item on the existing item in the community college section. So this item is number 972. And then we eliminated the attendance exemption record um, because the federal re statute related to it has been repealed. My apologies, my computer's a little jumpy today. So for the student record item, the specific record item, um, we've added a note clarifying what students covered under what students are covered under this item and the filing of transgender names. Um, so it's a little more it's a it's a little clearer, a little more specific. For A, we've added references to skills and achievement. In the skills and achievement um, commencement credential and the New York State Career Development and Occupational Studies, the CDOS commencement credential, uh, as well as employ employability profile and career path, career plan to Part A. For Section B, we've added screening, question, screening references to English profici proficiency records, including home language questionnaire and English language proficiency identification assessment results. For I, we've clarified the description. This item pertains to instances such as a public school district that doesn't have a high school, doesn't operate a high school, and only provides education through the eighth grade, but receives records from the high school students, the high schools that their students attend. Um, In this situation, both copies need to have a minimum retention period because the two separate local school, two separate local districts have to be able to maintain the records. Um, also, high school is amended to read high school, um, middle, or an intermediate school because of the way some of the, some districts are structured. We did add a um, item for unclaimed diplomas. That's going to be 
shoot, I don't have that number written down. We did add an item for unclaimed diplomas, uh, oh, and that's sub-item J, and for sub-item K is we added a proof of residency, residency records for students item as well. For the Teacher Resource and Computer Training Center, we updated retention periods of training records to reflect items that reflect NYSED's requirements that the continuing teacher and leader education CTLE sponsors training records must be retained for at least eight years. So the items that are affected by that are going to be 983, 984, and 987. And for transportation, we've added a sub-item to cover records relating to the training BOCES provides for school bus drivers who are not BOCES employees. Um, these courses are mandated by the state on, under um, New York State DMV Vehicle and Traffic Law. Um, that's going to be 1001, item number 1001. And we've added a new item to cover school bus photo violation monitoring system records. These are the photos taken by cameras mounted on the bus that capture photos of vehicles that decide that they do not want to stop when they're supposed to. Um, and this is going to be item 1294. All right. So we've survived that. Yay! You can do this. I absolutely believe in you. You can totally manage these records. So here's some things to remember. There are major changes to all sections of the schedule. Um, we've gone over some of the common ones here today alongside the ones that are specific to the unique records that school districts and BOCES are going to be managing. But they're not the only ones in the schedule that may affect you. I'm sure you all have fiscal records. I'm sure you all have meeting minutes. These are all going to be in different schedule, in different sections of the schedule. So you do want to make sure that you go through all of the items that are going to affect you and make sure that you have updated them accordingly. There are new items, but there are also, there are also updated retention periods across them. And please, please do not forget that the LGS needs to be adopted by January 1st, 2021. If you cannot find the res sample resolution, please email me or email your REO, your regional advisory officer, and we are more than happy to help you out in finding that. And who may be, who is your regional advisory officer? Well, if you're in Western New York, that's me. I'm, I'm, I'm right there at the top. Um, but we also have the lovely Lorraine Hill covering the Metro Long Island region. Michael Martin covering central New York and which is basically Watertown to Binghamton and points in between. Maria is covering the Capital District and North Country region and Dennis Riley is covering Catskill Hudson. All of us are here to help you and we want to. So if you have any questions, not just, you know, how do I use the schedule? Although certainly contact us on how do you, how do you use the schedule and how do I find this item? But any records management questions that you have, please feel free to reach out to us. We want to help. And finally, the release of the updated retention schedule is a good thing, honestly. And I know some of you are giving me some funny looks right now. And that's totally okay, I get that. Um, but it's a good thing, I swear. You now have a schedule that is updated to address recent laws and regulations. It covers record series that were itemless. It gives you access to the full breadth of the uh, local government retention items, even the items that were in schedules that you didn't have access to. Um, there's a whole lot there for you to use now, and it gives you more options. It's also a great opportunity for you to take a look at your record, the records retention aspect of your records management programs and see where improvements can be made. If you don't have an office schedule, maybe the time is now to develop them. You've got a whole new schedule to work from. If you've got an inventory that needs to be updated, well, maybe take a couple of days to refresh it and update the retention items associated with it. This gives you a reason to focus on records management, even if it's just a little bit to get things done that you've wanted to get done. And keep in mind that you are not alone in this. Um, as Rich mentioned, there are 420 people who registered for this. All of you are in the same boat. If you're sitting there feeling a little overwhelmed right now, just remember that you know the State Archives is here to help you navigate, and so are your neighbors. 
um, consider working together and working with us to share information and develop tools that can make everybody's life easier. And finally, keep in mind that implementing the retention schedule update in your local government is super important because you do want to be in legal compliance as you manage your records and dispose of them. But that's something that may take some time and thought depending on how you're currently using the schedule and where you are with that. Just like with any big project, take a big deep breath, get yourself a very nice coffee, venti, lots of cream and sugar if that's your thing, um, and map out what needs to be done before you dive in head first. Once you know what you need and have a plan, you can move forward with implementing it. It's going to take some time. Don't rush it. I have every faith that each and every one of you are going to navigate these changes beautifully, that you're going to do wonderful things, and this is going to be amazing for you. And just remember, if you have any questions as you move through the process, if you need any assistance, just call us. We're here to help. And with that, I will take questions. Okay, Sarah, we do have a number of questions here from folks. Uh, first and foremost, we've been getting some uh, emails, people have been or texting or uh, just sending me uh, notes here about getting a copy of the PowerPoint. All you have to do is email us at arctrain. Uh, that's the same email that provided the instructions uh, to you, which is A-R-C-H-T-R-A-I-N. Catch the Arc Train. That's at, <laughs> at nysed.gov, which of course is New York State Education Department. Gov, N Y S E D. Gov. So, okay, so we have a question here. Actually, we had a bunch of questions. People were asking about the sample resolution. Where can I get it? Uh, we did provide the link. I think people saw that. But also, we had questions about, do, uh, you know, where do I send a copy of the adopted resolution? And also, you know, who do we send it to? So maybe you could just talk about that briefly. Oh, okay. So I've talked to the folks in scheduling. We are not um, tracking your adopted resolutions. So you don't have to submit those to the archives once you've, once you've adopted them. You just need to do it for yourselves, document it, and you're done. Okay. Um, so we have a question here. Uh, is it po uh, this is basically during your search. Is it possible to use truncated keywords? What if someone has a suggestion for a new keyword? Um, please feel free to submit keyword suggestions at this uh, to us. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to implement them, but I'm, I'm sure we're very interested in seeing them. Um, you can use truncated terms. Um, you're just going to get all of the letters. So um, if you're searching for APPR, for example, um, you're going to get APPR, yes, but you're also going to get appropriate. So you want to make sure that you are using the best terms possible for you, but if it makes sense to use truncated terms, please feel free. Um, also, there's a question from Mindy. Um, she asked, can we electronically search for just quote unquote diamonds, meaning can we just see the major revisions in some format? Um, not at this time, I don't believe. But we are working on putting together some um, spreadsheets and documentation for you that would make it easier for you to identify the new, newly identified items. Um, those should be available in September. And Phyllis asked about uh, tax rolls. If they are on record with the state and county, does the school district still need to consider them permanent? We have tax rolls from two schools that no longer exist because they merged uh, to make a, a, a school district. Can, can uh, this can be very excessive, plus the paper version is not holding up so well for the oldest records. Um. Sarah. Yes, would you like to take this, Dennis? Well, I, I was waiting for this one to come up because I looked, looked up to see what our note says for that item uh, because this is one of the more common questions and confusing questions I've encountered. Mm -hmm. And only the warrant copy is considered permanent and the new note we have added to that states as follows. The official copy is often filed with the county. All towns turn over the warrant copy of the tax roll to the county except for Westchester County towns. And all school districts do except for city school districts. Uh, villages may turn over rolls to the county. So if you do turn your warrant copy back over to the county, they should be the ones who are managing that permanent copy. But I think um, it's a great conversation to have with your RAO and the county before you 
get rid of them? Are they the warrant copy? And if so, you know, verifying that the county has indeed um, retained them because it does vary from some, some counties. Um, also keep in mind any records that you have that date from 1910 and older, you do need to retain unless you get permission from the state archives to destroy them. So if they're older records, that's something to consider as well. Okay, we have a question from Rebecca. Uh, what has to be in the physical cumulative folders? For example, report cards, letters home regarding student of the month, copies of parent notification of 3-8 testing results, et cetera. That varies from district to district. I don't think there is a specific list of things that need to be included in it. Um, it's really something that you need to work out with your own district and potentially the state ed department. Okay, and um, Rebecca also asked uh, career plan in effect during the school year. Oh, there's, there's, I guess was a, there was a quote on our power, uh, PowerPoint that said, career plan in effect during the school year in which student exists high school. Does this, her question is, does this mean actual career path, like veterinarian, or will uh, saying, okay, will saying that the person attends to, intends to attend Cornell University work? Um, I don't think I'm getting the full nuance of that, so if you could email me that separately, I'd greatly appreciate it, and I'll answer it offline. Okay, um, so I also have a question here. Uh, from Lori, uh, she asks about recommendations on how to share the changes with pertinent staff. Oh, okay. So there, are, it a lot of it depends on how you're currently set up and what what communication paths are available to you. Um, if you have a records management plan and you have office schedules, you, I would rec consider updating your office schedules and then holding a training meeting to train folks on the updated office schedules. Um, if you don't have office schedules, maybe now is the time to consider developing them, but again, it's probably going to be a training meeting where you identify changes that have been made and how they're going to affect your government and the folks that are the records management specific figures in your different departments and your different schools. Um, I know everybody's set up a little differently. but. You know, I would totally recommend it and take this as an opportunity to reach out to your REO and talk about your current situation and how you're currently set up and work with them to devise a plan that's going to work best for you and how your your schools are set up. Okay, uh, we have a question here from Christina. Are there specific documents that must be retained in personnel files of former employees, especially former teachers? Um, we do identify permanent records in the, the retention schedule um, as permanent, but again, th this is one of those things where there, there's no prescribed list of what you, re records you need to be creating and maintain, um, so it's going to very much depend on your government. Okay, and um, Tracy, has, she says, I have questions about retention of paper ballots and paper ballot envelopes from the annual budget vote. Okay. Um, we do have an item uh, under the election section for ballots. Uh, I'm looking. I, uh, I know if you do, a, uh, why don't I just do a search for ballot? That was one of the ones I was testing earlier. Yeah, voting rec recording and tabulating records. Um, if it's a voted ballot, it's one year after the election. So whether it's paper or electronic. Um, does that answer the question, Rich? I was trying to remember. Okay, let's take a look here. I'll see. Uh, um, unused ballots are six months after the election. Spoiled, voided, or rejected ballots are one year. Um, I, I don't see that. Um, um, okay, I will put the link to the election section in the chat. Um, okay. But if you also search our nifty search function uh, for the word ballot or ballots, 
Um, All right. I was also going to point out, too, that, um, that Jennifer, uh, our colleague at the archives, uh, she had actually put out a couple of uh, posts just to let people know. Uh, there's, she mentioned there's a summary of major revisions available on our website, and she provided the link. Uh, and she also said, um, yes, so that, of course, is Jennifer from our New York State Archives Scheduling Unit, who honchoed the LGS-1 uh, makeover. So, so the, the, anybody interested in looking for seeing the summary of the major revisions, you can go to our website and you can follow that link. Uh, that she provided here on, in the chat. Um, also, okay, um, Deb, oh, I'm, Deb said, uh, I just missed Sarah's comment about keeping quote unquote old tax documents. What years are considered historical? Any records that are 1910 and older do need to be retained um, unless you get special permission from the State Archives to destroy them. Um, they are we had a very large fire in the state capitol in 1911, and we lost a lot of early state documents. So when they turn up, they turn up in local governments. So that's why that rule is in place. Um, but again, as, as Dennis said, you know, this is a discussion you, might, you probably want to have with your R, uh, RMO and the county to see, you know, if those are records that are being maintained elsewhere. We have a question here from Tony uh, asking, where can I find the retention period for paid invoice slash purchase orders for capital projects. Uh, it is not in the capital sections. Um, do, you, do you want to punt that to me, sir? Yeah, <laughs> please go ahead. <laughs> uh, it actually, it is, uh, let me just pull up the public property and equipment section uh, under the capital construction and public improvement project file um, sub item B talks about vouchers and claims. So repeat the question. Sure. Question again. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm, it says, uh, where can I find the retention period uh, for paid invoice yep. slash purchase orders? Yeah. So I would consider a paid, and correct me if you think differently, Sarah, but paid invoices would be the same as a claim or a voucher yeah. or a work order, which is, you know, again, trying to figure out what the function of the record and the terminology you use versus what we have in the schedule. So that would be sub item B to item 806, which is six years after um, essentially the project is, is completed. Yeah. Um, the, the schedule doesn't use natural language, it uses legal terminology, so sometimes you do have to do a little lateral thinking trying to figure out what's the best term to use um, for the records that you're looking for. Um, for example, receipts and vouchers. You, there's, you can't find receipts in the schedules, but you can find vouchers and they effectively mean the same thing. Okay. Um, let's see, moving right along here. Uh, Gail asks, uh, if we are electronically scanning documents, can we get rid of paper documents? Potentially, yes. Um, the 1910 rule is still in effect. You can still scan whatever you want. You just you need to con contact the State Archives and get permission before you can even consider getting rid of the 1910 records. Um, but yes, so following along with state law, if you're maintaining them appropriately according to our guidelines, um, creating the records appropriately according to our guidelines, um, you can potentially get rid of the permanent re the, the paper records if you are intending to keep the electronic records. Um, we do have on our website under managing records under publications um, a what's called our imaging guidelines, um, which explain how we expect you to scan your records, the formats you, that we want you to um, scan them in, the uh, appropriate uh, ways to store them as well as the appropriate ways to verify that you have appropriately scanned images. Um, once you do that, yeah, you could potentially do that, but you definitely want to read through the imaging guidelines first. Also, if you go to workshops, um, we have a bunch of recorded webinars under that section. I would totally watch the imaging we um, webinar as well, just to get a bit better sense of you know what you're getting into. And just to go back, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, go ahead, Sarah. 
No, it's just uh, you can scan records, and it does do a lot to save the, the amount of paper that you, space that you're storing paper. But there are a lot of costs associated with maintaining your records electronically, um, in terms of ongoing need to convert them to other formats, maintain the hardware and software that you're using to access them. So you really do have to do a lot of consideration before you you jump into that digitization project. That's all. And I was also going to just mention that uh, Jennifer uh, did uh, say here, uh, I believe the envelopes for absentee ballots would be covered under the voted ballot item that Dennis mentioned. So I think we, we got that. So I just want to acknowledge that uh, Jennifer did mention, uh, they put that out. Uh, Christina asks, are there specific documents that must be retained in personnel files of former, oh, we, we actually discussed that. Okay, uh, there we go. So Sheila, uh, asks, uh, once the new schedule is adopted by our board, we then start using that schedule, correct? Can our board adopt it any time between now and January 1? Yeah, you can adopt any time between now and, and, and January 20th, uh, January 1st, sorry. Um, but yeah, once you adopt it, you need to start using the LGS one. Okay, we have a question here from Deb. Uh, how long do we keep bands and bonds, so bands, B-A-N-S, and bonds. Um, and that's a question from Deb. Working on it. Okay. <laughs> is, um, I, I know it's something like 30 years after the bond is matured or something like that. Uh, it'll be in the fiscal section. There is a subsection uh, for bonds. Um, uh, I'm just... All good questions. Uh, yeah, it just takes a minute to find the ones that have specific uh, answers. Bond, but then there's also another, uh, I, I would punt this to whoever your REO is because then there is another uh, state law and maybe Jennifer who's listening can jump in about canceled obligations. Uh, there's something in the introductory, I believe, section uh, that talks about canceled obligations. So it's not as clear cut depending on um, type of bonds. But it's a fairly long period of time because bond, the, the period that bonds are are, are active, I, that's not the right word, but is usually something like 30 years. So I want to say it's something like 36 years. Um, I was going to add too, Jennifer did uh, chime in here. She's like our person in the matrix in the back room on the computer. Uh, she is, says right here, oh, I just lost the uh, disposition of bonds is regulated by uh, OSC, Office of the State Controller. And she says, see the introduction to LGS-1. That's what I was thinking of. So, yes. All right. And uh, let's see, we got Lori. Um, Okay, Lori just is saying she's looking in the chat and she's not seeing the link. Oh, you know what it may have been? The links may have been provided by Jennifer uh, to the, the links to the changes in the schedule uh, to us as panelists. So I'm going to go ahead and paste them in again. In the meantime, uh, Nancy says here, I see, I, um, I oversee the record center. Uh, and follow the current ED1 schedule, well, I have to change everything to the future LGS1? Unfortunately, you are going to have to make those changes um, once the schedule is adopted. Hopefully it's going to be relatively painless beyond updating just the numbers of the schedule numbers, um, which I, I, I'm not going to say that's not going to be a significant effort because it potentially could be. Um, but there shouldn't be too many individual item changes that affect you. Okay, and uh, let's see, we also have uh, Brenda uh, asks, if records have already been signed, uh, for their, uh, if the approval for destruction has been signed and are scheduled for destruction, but not yet destroyed, uh, and we have adopted the new LGS-1 in the meantime, do I then need to go through and check LGS-1 for retention again? Prior yes. to destruction? <laughs> yes, uh, pl please do that um, because you're now legally following the LGS-1, so you want to make sure that you are following along with the appropriate retention schedules based on the LGS-1. Okay, and uh, I'm just going to check to see here if there are any, any additional questions. I'm going to send uh, the message from Jennifer, which uh, lists the um, 
the revision the major revisions so the link is there is now there is uh, now available here in the chat box to that location and uh, let's see we got uh, some more questions here uh, Christine says just to add to the voting envelope question uh, this is from Christine because of the unusual vote this year by all absentee ba ballots I believe it is an attestation and it is covered under quote register of voters and poll book unquote which is five years Um, I'm going to defer that to our, my scheduling unit com um, compatriot. Okay, so let's see, you got a couple more questions here uh, popping up as we speak. Uh, we have here um, Joanne, uh, where would I find regular paid claims and purchases, or I'm sorry, where would I find regular paid claims and purchase orders not associated with capital projects? Um, they're going to be in the fiscal section, and as I pull that up, I think we call it purchasing file. Yeah, this is the term we use. Okay, and let's see if we have any additional questions. Let's say we're about uh, six minutes after the hour. We do have some uh, time padded in here. Uh, Jennifer uh, just uh, chimed in here. She said, in terms of the absentee ballot envelope question, she says uh, she's going to look into it and get back get back to us. Uh, so perhaps, uh, again, some of these questions, you know, we can come put together a frequently asked questions list and maybe mail it to all the, email it to all the registrants. That may, that may work. Yeah, and again, folks, don't hesitate to contact your RIOs with, with these questions as well, because we're more than happy to email, work with you in, in figuring these things out. Um, the purchasing file is going to be number uh, 547 in, in the new LGS one. Okay. Um, John uh, asked a question here. Uh, do campus security provisions apply to school district campuses? Um, how so? Hmm. Is he referring to the security? security items that might be in the community college section because I know with community college there's the Clery Act oh, yeah. revised well, um, requirements yeah. for student safety that yes John does clarify yes in the community college section he says we have five buildings on one campus um I think we're gonna have to get back to you on that sir Yeah, my, my sense is that if it's in the community college section and you're not a community college, then it would not apply to you. Yeah, that's and kind I of what I'm thinking too. I will admit that on the spot, I don't recall the provisions of the Clery Act that relate to campus safety and security. I do remember um, one provision specifically related to on-campus housing. But um, before becoming an RAO, this is, this is what I was doing, was helping with these changes, hence why I know this arcane and esoteric information. Um, but yes, I would second Sarah's uh, contact your RAO just to make sure that we can work that out. Yeah. Okay, uh, John said, uh, Thanks. So, um, all right. Well, let's see. We got another question here from um, question here from Mindy. Uh, okay. So, well, she has a comment here. Uh, would it be okay to cut off specific questions which start out with "Where do I find"? "Quote unquote." I bet people haven't done any research on this, and all they can they can look after this, uh, look at later, or contact their representative, uh, their RAO, regional advisory officer, I suppose. Um, so, um, well, I, I suppose you know as we go along here, uh, the questions are trickling in, so we we do have a bit of time, and we have talked in the past about having a you know kind of a ask your you know 
regional advisory officer session here in these. Uh, but as we've mentioned already, folks can certainly ask their regional advisory officer offline about these special specific questions or to find things. Um, and just Jennifer just actually said, the Clery Act applies to colleges and universities. So. Thank you. Okay, well, I don't really see any new questions popping up. Um, and uh, as we had mentioned, you know, certainly um, please go to our website. Under the bottom, you've got a contact us uh, item to reach out to the regional advisory officer uh, who handles your county. The, we are here to uh, help you. We're here to a uh, answer your questions. And sometimes we add to people, uh, add because people ask if it, we're free. Of course, yes, we are. Um, and uh, you can always email us at arctrain at niced.gov. That's arctrain, A-R-C-H-T-R-A-I-N dot N-Y-S-E-D dot G-O-V. And we will send your question to the right person um, and we'll get you an answer. So other than that, uh, Sarah, Dennis, any last uh, comments before we close? You can do this. I know it's, it might seem intimidating, but believe me, this is something that you absolutely can do. And if you need the help of your REO to set up a plan to get yourself into a position where you can do it, please don't hesitate to contact us. We're here to help you, and I really appreciate all of you coming out today. Okay, goodbye, everybody. <laughs>